Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Jean Tomasi and Webster, Greenberg Traurig, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Happ Investment Developers, Herrick Feinstein, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman USRealty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the CUNY TV Foundation, the Continuum Company, Urban American, and these friends. So you get these kids, they grow up in Ozone Park, and then they say, you know, I want to be a Marine. I want to be a cop. I, I don't know. I want, to, you know. I want to be in the pizza business. I really don't. Maybe the movie business. And then they become one of the best real estate brokers in the city of New York. I'm lucky to have Tom Donovan today. Hi, Thanks Michael. for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so tell me about the uh, grandparents. Let's, let's go back on your mother's side first. Tell me about them. Um, my grandfather Gaetano, my grandmother Anna, um, from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Where did they originally come from? Uh, grandma was from, her parents were from Sassano, Naples, and my grandfather, Rosano, Calabria. And so they came over what, like 1908? Uh, they were actually born here. The, uh, it was their parents that were born in the late 1800s, uh, right. came over. And, and what did the grandpa do? He was... Uh, he, he owned a dump trucks and was an excavator. A dump truck and excavator in Ozone Park. That's a, that's not, no, I know they were in Bed-Stuy, okay? We'll, we'll get to that. So they lived in, in Bed-Stuy on East New York Avenue? Uh, Bedford and Decal. My grandmother's from East New York Avenue. Okay. And uh, now tell me about your, your dad's side. Uh, I believe his mom was a stay-at-home mom, and his father was a truck delivery man, but with horse and buggies, not with trucks. Any idea what he, where was he delivering? Um, I believe it was goods to department stores, and apparently he was known for being able to back the, the buggy in pretty well. Oh, okay. So, uh, so here, here's the question. You, you were telling me that, I, I think it was grandma and grandpa, they lived in this three-family home, uh, in, in Brooklyn, right? With yes. a couple of relatives. So who, were the, who was in the building? Um, it was my grandfather's side of the family. So it was my grandfather, uh, his brother and his sister, and they had a three-family home, and they each took a different floor. So my mother, parents had one floor. My uncle and his wife and kids had one floor, and my aunt and her husband and, and children had a floor. It was a good, easy way, you know, for the family to be together. Correct. And so you know, it was the whole family over there. And now, was it Grandpa who used to smoke the cigar? My grandfather was an avid cigar smoker. What the uh, now? He, since he was the Italian, was did he have the the thin ones? No, he um, well, later on in life we, we used to go to J and R and get him the, the the brand name knockoffs. But he uh, he would smoke every, any cigar that anybody would give him. He, was, he, he had, liked the cigars. He liked okay. the cigars. So tell me, okay, so your mother was born in Brooklyn. Born in Brooklyn. Okay, and your father was born where? Uh, Brooklyn as well. They were both they met in Bed Stuy. Right, and you told me I think it was they, they met because it was some family friend or somebody introduced uh, them. My mother and her 
and her brother, uh, my father was my mother's brother's best friend. And my mother's best friend married my mother's brother. So the four best, you know, brother and sister and, and two best friends kind of dated. Now, you, you told me when we got together that uh, your father, you think, was in the Navy? At the uh, he was in the Navy at the tail end of World War II. Right. And then he came back. Came back. Okay, and your mother and father got married. They got married. And um, they were living where? In Brooklyn at this time? In Brooklyn, somewhere in, in Bedford Stuyvesant. I'm not sure the exact block. Okay. Then your older brother was born. My older brother was born. Okay. Then your sister was born. My sister was born. And then, as they would say proverbially, the baby was born. You are born, but by this time, the family had moved, you said, to Ozone Park. Ozone Park, Queens, Pitkin Avenue. Okay, but Pitkin Avenue was in Brooklyn also, wasn't it? Uh, we, we live four blocks from the Brooklyn-Queens border. Okay, so you moved to Ozone Park. And, and you were saying to me, you know, um, growing up, you were poor, but you never felt poor. Yeah. Well, we were lucky. We had my maternal grandparents who lived with us. Um, so we didn't have a lot of money, but... Now, this was your, your mother's parents? My mother's parents. Right. Uh, originally with, the ex the with, with the dump truck? Right. My grandfather got sick in 1974. So the first, I was born in 69. So the first five years, I remember him avidly going to work you know, every day. And then he retired after, you know, after being sick. But I, I do remember the dump truck at, at our house at Pitkin Avenue. But you know, we always had the family was all together. Um, every holiday was at my mother's house, so you know there's always a lot of people around and always you know crowd around the table. So you know when, when people show you the right amount of love and attention, you never feel poor. Now, what you, you, your mother really, you know, uh, your mother and father separated, got divorced when you were young, but you, you, your your mother really wanted you and your uh, sister to be dancers. What what was this? You know, well, tap dancing. I mean, I. I well, I, I realize, you know, that uh, <laughs> I thought I saw you in uh, the, the Wiz, but... Uh. Well, when we were kids, um, my mother wanted my sister to go to dancing school, but we couldn't afford it. So on Sundays, uh, she would go scrub the dancing school floor. Um, so as barter, let's call it, so my sister go to dancing school. And, you know, as the youngest, younger child, I had to go to dancing school as well. So hence my dance background. That was your dance background. So t talk to me. Where do you, where do you go to public school? Um, I actually went to Catholic school. I went to St. Fortunata and Linden Boulevard in East New York, uh, St. Francis Prep, and I attended St. John's. We'll, we'll get to that later on. Okay, so uh, now where, where was the first Catholic school? Uh, St. Fortunata and uh, Linden Boulevard and Crescent Street in East New York, Brooklyn. So that was in East New York. Yes. And then high school? Uh, St. Francis Preparatory in, in Fresh Meadows. Boy, you went to Queens now. When you were a kid, uh, one of your first occupations was, uh, what, the pizza delivery uh, guy? Well, my first, when I was a young kid, I, I was 11 or 12, I actually was the busboy in the pizzeria. And then as I where, got older... Where was the pizzeria? Uh, in Oswald Park, Queens, Aldo's Pizza. And then as I got older and I got my driver's license, uh, you know, I got the, you know, the big bucks, I was able to deliver pizza in the neighborhood. Wait, and then didn't you say to me you, you were at Chili's? You got a job at Chili's? Uh, Chi Chi's? Uh, Chi Chi's Mexican restaurant. I was a busboy there as well. They always had, I remember when my kids were growing up, they had, you know, this Polo Magnifico, uh, you know, and they had the, the candle, at the, right? The most thing, thing I remember most was the fried ice cream. I've never heard of fried ice cream before that. Right. So uh, did you enjoy working over there? Um, I was never afraid to work. You know, you know I, I liked having better things than I did when I was younger, so... You know, if it meant working a little bit extra, you know, never really bothered me. So you said to me that one of your neighbors was a Marine. Yes. And, and you felt that, you know, it would be great to be a Marine. So what happened? You, uh, well, one of my next-door neighbors, who's still a very dear friend of mine, um, he had joined, he was a few years older than me, and he had joined the Marines. So I used to see him come home, and I saw the respect that he got in the neighborhood, you know, you know with the sharp uniform and, and such. And I wasn't really doing all that well at school. So I kind of needed a different direction, something you know, to put me, not, not, not on track, but just to help me get on a better track. So I went and I, I enlisted in the United States Marine Reserve. So now the kid from Queens goes down to uh, Paris Island? Paris Island. Yeah, I have that picture of you in Paris Island, very, you know, chic. So how do you like the first three months of basic training in Paris Island? Um, everybody should have to do it. It's very, very different. Um, they basically cut you off from the rest of the world no telephones for, you know, for 12 weeks, and you, know, you had one hour a day to yourself, but the rest of the time it was on a strict you know, pattern and you know, their schedule, and you, know, you could write letters. Yeah, but when you're, uh, I guess when I was in the Army Reserve, 
uh, and being trained. We, we, you know, we had the same. I was there with RA, regular army. You were with regular Marines. Right. These people who were, who made a two-year commitment or a three-year commitment than right. Marines, uh, which you knew that. Uh, I was going home after. You, you were going home. Yeah. Okay. You know, made it a little bit more palatable. Made, yes. made, and so after the first 12 weeks, where'd you go? Uh, I, I went out to a field radio operator school in 29 Palms, California. That was nice. It, the desert's nice. It was right in the middle of the desert. And you were, you were radio operator? Radio operator. So, but did you want to be a, ever want to be a disc jockey when you were a kid? No, it's a very different radio operator, Michael. <laughs> this is you know, radio communications, basically you know, transporting messages from the front lines back to supply. You took every one of the New York City tests. I uh, took f the police, firemen, uh, sanitation, I believe the court officers. Um, th you know, that's all I can remember. But I remember you know, quite a few Saturdays uh, at John Adams High School taking you know, city, city exams. So you come back from the, uh, the six months, and then what happens? Oh, I was a reservist. And then about two years later, I was still going to St. John's. Um, I got called at, you know, about when I turned 19 and a half. I got called to start my investigation for the New York City Police Department. So you're back now. So what were you doing those two years? I was going to school and delivering pizza. You get accepted, you told me, to the police corps. Uh, the police academy. I was uh, 20 years old in four months. So I was, I was the, the youngest in my academy class and one of the youngest New York City cops ever. So you get in the academy and then what happens? When, was it, you get a phone call or something? Uh, I or graduated you? the police academy um, in October sometime. And the morning of Thanksgiving, which is, you know, six weeks later, uh, we're working the Thanksgiving Day Parade. And while I was working, my mother got a call that our unit got activated to go to, to Operation Desert, at the time, Desert Shield. Um, but before I got home, I had run into two of my reserve buddies at the parade, and they kind of told me ahead of time. So I knew, I didn't know my mother knew, and we didn't discuss it until after Thanksgiving. So how long were you in the uh, police force at this time before you got activated? Uh, I did the police academy in six weeks. And then? And then I, went, I got activated to reserve duty, and then I was gone from basically December 1st through June 1st. Where do you go now? Uh, we went down to North Carolina for a month, then they flew us to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and then I ended up in Kuwait City. So how long were you in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait City? Um, from January to May. So tell me about the, uh, the summer or the winter in uh in Kuwait City. Well, it was surprisingly, when we got there, it was surprisingly wet and cold. So the first, you know, two or three weeks, it was probably in the high 30s, 40 degrees. And I think it rained every day or every other day. So all our gear and equipment were wet. And then in a matter of course of two weeks, it went from 30, 40 degrees to, to, 100, okay. to 95 to 130 degrees in a matter of a month. Now, when you were there, you were a field radio operator. Field radio operator, yes. So, uh, but you did get a combat... Uh, Our unit, I was attached to the uh, headquarters company, 8th Marines. Uh, we received the combat action ribbon, which means our unit took fire and returned fire. Luckily, I personally didn't have to. Good. So you come back. Now, when is this? Uh, when do you, when this do you is, come back? This is May of 1991. So it's May of 1991. You come back and you go back to Ridgewood, Queens. Well, I lived in Ozone Park and I went right, to no, work no, in, Ridgewood, in Ridgewood, Queens. Uh, and so you're a patrolman, right? Patrolman. Okay, so tell me, uh, you know, people look at the police. You, you said to me it was eventful but uneventful, right? Uh, yeah, mo most, most of the police work is a lot of hurry up and wait, like the military. You know, a lot of patrolling around, not much going on. But, you know, action happens at the split second when you least expect it. So you kind of always have to be sharp. But there's a lot of, you know, sitting around, waiting around, you know, babysitting, you know, glorified babysitting, let's call it. But you said to me, w which was very interesting, you said that which has helped you in your business career being a, a cop you learn you could see through people you, you you're able to analyze people better because you gain great people skills when they're on the defensive right or something well, like that in, in all aspects you learn i learned how to deal with superiors i learned how to deal with people of equal you know my my constituents but you also deal with the public and you know different people's percep perceptions um, different cultures, and you can tell very quickly when someone's being very straightforward with you and passionate, or if they're being evasive. And and sometimes the most calm people are the ones that are kind of being the most evasive. So it's all, it's all about mannerisms and how how people respond to to actions and, and reactions. How did it come up one day 
uh, the story about uh, becoming a real estate broker? Um, I never felt that I fully fit in being a cop. And my older brother and, and my accountant, who passed since passed away, always kind of pushed me that there was something better for me out there. Um, a few years later, my grandmother passed away, and we were contemplating selling selling our house. Um, and my friend and I always, you know, after work, he was in the carpenter stolen business, and he used to work in these beautiful luxury homes. And he would tell me about certain neighbors that I'd never even heard of. Yeah, you told me one, one of these something with an M in Queen? Malba. 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 I, I never. Where is Malba? Uh, it's basically under, under the Whitestone Bridge. Um, it's a you know beautiful neighborhood. So we, he would work in a lot of homes there. So we'd go driving around looking at houses and say, hey, one day this could be ours, you know, type type thing. And we used to figure out how much we would have to make to be able to afford the house and the boat and all, and all this. So when my mother put the house up for sale, um, we had some brokers coming through the house. And I saw a gentleman coming in with beautiful suits on. I'll never forget, one guy came with this beautiful 740 BMW. And I'm like, wait a minute, I could have this by walking through people's houses, which is kind of my hobby anyway. So I went and got my real estate license. And, you know, so you got you got you and, and who do you work for? What kind of? I work for a local real estate company. That actually, the gentleman that was selling my mother's house, uh, you know, local guy, small shop, still in business. You know, very nice, very nice man. Um, but I never but, really made any money. Right, but you also had a, a, a bad experience. You said. Yeah, yeah, one of the local you know s businessmen. Um, we sold something for him, and he refused to pay. And I'm like, you know, one thing I learned a long time ago is you don't go to work for free. So I saw that you know it wasn't working out in that neighborhood, and I kind of kind of stopped working. Okay, so, you, but you're doing this while you're still a cop? I'm still a New York City cop. Okay, so now you decide that, let's forget real estate for a little while, okay? I got the job as the police, I can make my time. Um, <clears throat> and then how do you decide to get involved in the abstract business? Um, I was looking for, again, a, you know, a side business, something. Um, I had gotten hurt at work as, as a cop, so I was looking for something maybe if I retired on a, on a disability, something kind of going forward that I could use my, you know, my mind. Um, so I was offered a position at Ridge Abstract in Brooklyn, um, which, I, which I readily took. And it was a great experience. It was you know, a great company, and they treated me really well. And I learned you know, quite a bit. So how does, okay, so now I got the, the kid who was a Marine, a cop, a, a real estate salesman, a title abstract guy, how do you get back into the real estate? What's how? how, how my, my grandfather Gatano, the cigar smoker, passed away in 1998, and at my grandfather's funeral, a clients of my brothers, who have now become very dear clients of mine, and, and more importantly, very good friends of mine, came to pay respects to the family, and you know, just talking, they said, "Oh, we're renovating this townhouse on the Upper East Side, and when it's done in a month or so, we're going to have a broker open house. Um, Nick's our attorney on it. Why don't you come?" To, to, the, to the event, and I had never been in a, in a six-story townhouse on, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan that was renovated into a one-family mansion. So I, I, every day I kept telling my brother. Wait a second, maybe you could get the 740 BMW too. I didn't. Think, I had no delusions okay. that I was ever going to be the, the broker on that. It was right. this is more you know an explorer. A look at it. I just wanted okay. to say I, I was you know at a party what? in a mansion. That's right. It's always nice to. Um, so when when I went to the party with with my brother, uh, Paul Massey was there, and Paul Massey was a listing broker on that. On, on the townhouse at the time. Uh, so over, over Heineken, we were talking, and he asked me how my real estate career was going. So I kind of told him you know, the backstory of how I wasn't doing it anymore, and I was, you know, had just recently gotten into title. And he asked me if I would ever do it again. And I said, for the right company, sure, but you know, it's not something I'm exploring at this time. And you know, the night went on, it was a beautiful evening, and I thought that was the end of it. And then? Uh, about a month later, a, cu a couple weeks later, um, I was working nights at the time as a cop. I got home about 2 o'clock. Oh, right, because you were doing the, t the abstract during the day. Right, and I got home about 2 o'clock in the morning, 1.30, and I got a call, and if anyone knows Paul, he, he likes to be at his desk about 6.30 in the morning. I got a call at 7 a.m. from Paul asking if I would come in and speak with him and Bob Knackle. And? Um, so, so I went. What was, what was Massey and Knackle at this time? Uh, at the time. They were small. They were. At the time, they, they were. They had a small little operation. Um, the two the, guys had started there. They just celebrated the 25th anniversary. Um, that this is 1998, so this is like uh, they were 10 years old. 10 years old. Okay, they had a Manhattan office. That they, they, they were at 400 Park. Uh, it was, you know, Bob and Paul. They, they had just made John Serralo a partner, and Christy Moyle was there, and I think maybe about seven or eight other brokers. And and, and, what, and what they say to you? 
Um, well, at first I thought it was just a favor that, you know, they said they were looking to do something in Queens. And I thought they needed like a favor, like helping them find some office space or something, like someone to do some legwork for them. And I'll never forget, it was, uh, it, was, it was a Tuesday, November 9th. It was my birthday. And uh, my family were going out to Pete, uh, not Peter Lucas, um, Angelo Maxi's for dinner after this. So I had a pair of khakis on and a sweater. And if you know Maxi and Echo, the very Michael Stollerist, you know, very, you know, suspenders, you know, white shirts, ties, and jackets. I wear blue. Okay. As am I today. But uh, we, I sat down with them. They said, oh, tell us about your real estate career. So about five minutes in, I said, is this a job interview? And they got a good chuckle out of it because they thought my brother had said something to me, which my brother didn't. He wanted me to go and do it on my own. So, you know, we got a good chuckle on it. A week later, we, I went back and... But you, now, so now you still have the night shift at the police force? For, yes. I did that for one more year. And then, you know, I started doing well with the real estate. And I realized that this was my calling. So uh, the millennium was coming. And I was like, I didn't want to work another Christmas or another New Year's. So December 22nd of 99, I resigned. So how many years had you had in? Nine years, seven months, and 20 days. Uh, could, could you be more precise? <laughs> and 20 days. Yeah. Okay, so now you come, okay, the, the, the kid who spent basically his entire life in Queens comes to Manhattan, right? But you, you, you come to Massinackle, who have a very interesting approach with territories, and your territory, needless to say, is Queens, because you walk the beat, as well, they would say well, in Queens. One of the things that, reasons why they interviewed with me and such was because at the time they had a good presence in Manhattan and they didn't want to change disciplines of real estate. So they decided initially to grow geographically. And Queens was the first pr progression. And being a Queens native and being a cop in Queens, I, you know, I kind of fit the puzzle pretty well. So tell me about uh, starting, now, this is your next career. How, how, how was it, you know, because you, you, you had that poor experience, you know, with the local entrepreneur over there. Uh, how, how do you get? Well, one thing I learned is that no one, I'm, I'm not smarter than anyone else. And I said, these guys have a proven system. I'm going to follow their system to the law. And I said, I said to myself, I said, this is my one shot. Um, and I'm not going to do everything they tell me to do. So if they say be in early, work late, and do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to do it perfectly. So I followed, I followed their system, and you know, luckily it, it worked out well for me. Now, when, when did they make you a partner? Um, somewhere around 2001. But also 2001 was the terrible tragic events of 9-11, which happened to have an effect on everyone's business over yes. here. And so, uh, as they would say in the, in the business world, you've seen the ups and you've seen the downs yes. uh, of, the, of the real estate business. Yes. So, you know, during, during your career at Massey, what would you say some of the most creative or interesting transactions you, you might have worked on? Um, well, I've been fortunate to work with some really, really great people. Um, you know, some, more importantly, I've, been, I've had some really lo loyal clients. So, to say one transaction is better than another, I'd rather focus on the people I've worked with. Uh, you know, I've lucky, you know, certain clients have sold 30 and 40 buildings for. So, you know, I'd rather focus on that than, than the individual transactions. Okay, so it's really the people. The people. Like, you know, I, I, I was lucky enough to sell the Monte Excelsior, which is, you know, a trophy Queens apartment building. Um, so, that, you know, people kind of know that because everybody who drives out to Long Island, they pass it on the Grand Central. But, you know, the Lavin family, the Corwin family, the Pradium group, you know, they've been, they've been wonderful to me. And, you know, Manny Malakon and... Barry Rodofsky and, you know, Elias Diodoropoulos, who, you know, we've had on the show together. Um, you know, I've been very, very lucky. And if I'm, if I'm leaving anybody out, I apologize, but yeah. I wasn't expecting that question. No, okay. It was, you know, but real estate business is a people business. And people, people like to do business who are nice to them. And that's what the good thing is. So, you know, you told me another interesting thing. Uh, uh, what was it, 2009, you and your brother were... Um, in California, come on, this is a good little uh, story. My, my brother and I, uh, you know, very, very close. He's, you know, he's been a very big supporter of mine. So, um, and he's a very tight schedule. So when he has some free time, he and I like to t take, you know, a brother's trip. You know, sometimes it's twice, three times a year. Sometimes. Now, how, how many? What's the difference in age? Uh, he hates when I say this, but he's five and a half years older than I am. Okay. Uh, so we were out in L.A., Los Angeles, for my for my birthday weekend, and we got asked if we wanted to be so wh wh where would you get asked I mean you know so that sounds like a you know uh, a setup question uh, where were you when you got uh, we were we were in in in, in SDK in, in Los Angeles and they had a little nightclub in the front and 
the waitress who was serving us asked us if we were actors from New York. And we said, well, we're from New York, but we're not actors. And she says, oh, we're filming a movie, and I need a New York lawyer and someone to play a bodyguard. So my brother said, well, I am a New York lawyer. So we got a good chuckle out of it. And two weeks later, we went back and we filmed a part of a movie called Beyond the Trophy. And your brother played the lawyer? My brother played a mob attorney, and I played a, a, a mob enforcer. So, well, so how, how long was your role in this? Um, I think I had maybe 12 speaking lines. Or maybe my brother had 12, maybe I had six. You know, a couple of punches here and there. So. Okay, an eventful uh, movie? I was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not winning the Academy Award, but it was a lot of fun to do. Right. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, you, you nearly, uh, you know, fortunately when you were in the military and the police, you really didn't see that much action. Right. But you saw, you came down with a brain tumor, right? Uh, yeah, July 2006. What happened? Um, you know, tough time, you know, in the city. It was up, you know, 100 degrees for like two weeks straight. Um, you know, I was going through, a, a, you know, some personal breakups and, and stuff. And you thought it was And nothing. I just thought it was the stress of life. And then uh, I got rushed to the hospital, and I was in Queens, and I said, take me to Elmhurst. And my brother insisted that we go to NYU. And they gave me a CAT scan before they took my blood pressure and basically saved my life. That's great. And you've been involved with that because you, you, you believed in giving back to the community. I know you, yes. you're involved with the, the, the Tumor Association. I'm, involved, I'm on the board of the Brain Tumor Foundation. I'm on the board of uh, an ovarian cancer charity. I'm involved with Cooley's anemia. And you're also involved with uh, my f one of my favorite uh, social clubs, uh, uh, the charitable, the Columbus yeah. Society. Yeah. I, uh, I, at an award ceremony last week, I was honored to meet uh, Salvatore Genta, who's a, a Medal of Honor recipient, and I just donated a, col a college scholarship in his name to the Columbus Foundation for the next four years. And, and mom is still living in Queens? My mother is, lives in Be uh, Bell Harbor, Queens now. Oh, so you, you changed from Ozone Park. Yes. Okay, but you know, it wasn't too far away. No, about 10 miles. Okay. Maybe even less. Okay. Um, I'm happy to say that you're a friend, and I'm happy to say that uh, you've, you've had a, a very interesting life, and only good things are going to happen in the future. And thanks for Thank being here. Thank you very much, here. Michael.